Hello everybody, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and today we're having a look at this magnificent aircraft. This is the Seawechsel and we're doing this courtesy of Navy Wings, an organization that is dedicated to keeping these aircraft of the fleet air arm flying and in a perfect pristine condition. Check out the description below to find some helpful links there. Now the Seawix, let's talk about its history first, then we're going to do the walk around. Then of course I'm going to jump inside and explain you all the details there. The Seawixen, well, it starts out uh, as a program for both the RAF and the Royal Navy. Both are, of course, looking to keep updating their inventory with newer, faster jet-powered aircraft. And in the early 1950s, the Havilland comes up with an aircraft called the 110, the DH-110. Now, for the RAF and the Royal Navy, they're at this time looking for an aircraft that can be a fighter platform, a night fighter, as well as having some ground strike potential. During this time, the uh, Vampire is already in service, the Venom is in development, and eventually the Royal Navy, although it was interested in the DH-110, drops out, opting to just go with the Venom. The RAF uh, keeps being interested until around about 1952. There's a tragic incident at the Farnborough Air Show where one of these aircraft, or rather the DH-110, which would eventually become this aircraft, uh, goes into a supersonic dive, a move that it is known for by this point already, pulls up in front of the crowd and literally disintegrates into confetti, killing tragically both operators as well as a number of spectators on the ground. This shows the Havilland that the aircraft's construction, which was largely based on the Vampire and the Venom, really needs to be updated in order to resist the speeds and the strenuous environment that the new aircraft will be uh, operating in. So a tragic incident, yes, but also a learning experience. Around about this time, however, the RAF starts losing an interest because while by the time the second prototype is built, in 1954 and is uh, doing more flight testing, they opt to go with the Gloucester Javelin instead. By this point in time, once again plot twist however, while the RAF drops out, the Royal Navy is back in saying that it is looking now to get a replacement for the Venoms. And at this point, the aircraft in 55 starts conducting land trials, then in 56 carrier trials, and in 59 is introduced into the Royal Navy as part of the fleet air arms inventory. The Sea Vixen, as it is known now, is introduced as the FAW-1. That stands for Fighter All Weather, explaining to you also the role of this aircraft in a nice little concise package. And it stays in service round about until 1970. It doesn't really see that much use in operational combat duties. It usually is just part of a carrier fleet and a show of force wherever the Royal Navy goes. But it is an integral part of a fleet air arms strike wing and uh, fighter complement for many, many years. All in all, 145 are built, although roughly one third of the airframes are destroyed in incidents, crashes, and so on and so forth. Navy Wings, of course, has this aircraft still in their inventory, and they're also restoring it once again uh, into a flight-worthy condition. So with that rounded up, let's have a walk around. I'm going to, as always, start on the nose. We're going to move over to the starboard wing, around that, loop around the tail, come by the port wing, and then back towards the cockpit section, and then we're gonna jump inside. So, you ready? Perfect, let's go. Up front, of course, we have the Radom. This houses an uh, radar system known as the AI Mark 18. AI Mark 18. What does AI stand for? Nowadays, it stands for artificial intelligence. Back then, it stands for airborne interception. This is a radar system that uh, operates in the X-band, uh, peak at uh, 180 kilowatts. It's a 75 uh, centimeter diameter dish, operating at a plus and minus 100 degrees in the azimuth and plus 50, minus 40 degrees in elevation. Overall, this is a fairly competitive radar system at the time. It's able to pick up, depending on the, what aircraft you find out there, aircraft at a range of up to 75 kilometers, of course, depending on the RCS and the conditions and the environment involved. A lock-on, however, is achieved generally at significantly less than half of the distance uh, that you would detect an enemy aircraft. The one 
negative aspect about this radar system, the Mark 18, um, was that its lookdown performance, generally quite complex for radar systems anyway, was rather poor. So that means that any aircraft flying below the Sea Vixen would uh, be significantly harder to detect. With the uh, radar system um, then checked off, let's have a look down here. We of course find the front gear that swivels by uh, 45 degrees in order to allow uh, you to have a better ground handling as you're taxiing to the runway and back of course. We have a couple of landing lights and look down lights for your landing and over here would also be the initial location it's missing now in, in this configuration. Um, of the uh, UHF antenna as well as the IFF antenna. A little bit further back here, we also find, of course, one of my uh, favorite aspects of any sort of aircraft, and that is the air brake. Then let's have a look at this blister that you see around about here. This blister is mirrored on the other side of the aircraft and features rockets. 14 two-inch rockets, two-inch, that is 51 millimeters. And as it was an integral part in the Sea Vixen's design, they could just be popped out. You fire your 14 rockets aside, pop them back in, and uh, that's you good to go uh, head back to base. As we move up here, we of course find the first crew station. This would be for the observer, sort of a co-pilot who is mainly focused on uh, operating the radar system and so on. We'll have a closer look at uh, that station in the future and I'll talk a little bit more about the details there as well. We have a little bit of a window here for more light. This crew station, mind you, was initially known as the coal pit or the coal hole because it was incredibly dark. Of course, that has its reasons. You want to have good contrast on your radar scope, but it also made it a very uncomfortable and sort of gloomy position to sit in. Of course, to get up there, you would also be using the ladder. By the way, if you're uh, picking up some sound right now, right now, this is a working hangar, so it's just how it is. It's a beautiful environment to be in. The uh, air inlet for the uh, starboard engine, we can see that here. And on the top, a little bit out of view right now, we also have the electrical systems and uh, the avionics systems just behind the cruise stations. And we would also find the uh, first fuel tanks. The aircraft features 12 fuel tanks, four of which are in the fuselage. Uh, two on either side and they're actually combined so you could make an argument that they're actually one fuel tank together fused together which is why instead of saying four fuel tanks in the fuselage it's maybe a little bit more accurate of saying that it's a two and by two system additional fuel tanks are also installed in the boom there's one additional fuel tank there and then three fuel tanks per wing which rounds it up to a nice even 12 uh, with 1,300 gallons in the aircraft. Of course, external stores could be added as well. We also find an additional air intake on both sides for the electrical generators. This provides the cooling as well as feeding into the air conditioning system. And then of course, over there, we find the gear on either side uh, that swings inwards. The covering flap currently is retracted in itself. Uh, but yeah, that would provide that uh, tricycle landing gear for the aircraft. Let's move on with the wing. Talking then about the boom, we already have uh, talked about the fuel tank in there. Avionics are also set in here. And the wing itself, let's talk about that a little bit, swept at 40 degrees. And there is a, a powered wing fold as well that sits right here. That of course allows you to greatly decrease the span of the aircraft in over to make them fit on the elevators and also to fit more aircraft into uh, the confined space of a carrier. We already see some of the outboard stores here. I'm just going to ignore them for now because we're going to talk about those on the port wing. And we're going to move over to this fence right here. This is known as a wing fence and you wouldn't pick it up from where you are looking at it now. But this is also a dog tooth, meaning that if I just put my hands here, you'll see that the difference between the wings is just about so. This part 
of the wing that extends all the way to the wing tap is slightly further than the inner portion of the wing. That is known as a dog tooth and it creates a vortex that greatly improves the uh, boundary layer extension across the wing, making for better handling characteristics, generally speaking. The wing fence itself uh, prevents the uh, movement of the air uh, across the, uh, the whole wing and thus then also prevents a stall from occurring across the whole section of the wing rather than just on the output section, which again uh, makes it a little bit easier on the pilot, especially at lower speeds and uh, higher angles of attack. As we move across towards the wing tap, we of course find the beta tube for speed measurements. And then we come to the outside, we have of course your navigational lights, and then we move towards the aileron. You can already see a part of the aileron separated here into the wing tip, and that is the mass balance. And as we then loop around the side, we can see the massive aileron. It really is massive going from over there all the way onto the mid-wing section. And this works in the following manner. So you have the actuators and the autopilot uh, servers just ahead of it. And the aileron is powered by the hydraulical system, two hydraulic systems, in fact, the uh, yellow and blue. Now, there is no direct control between this aileron and the pilot. All he does is pull on his stick and that control input is then translated via the hydraulical systems towards the aileron, which means that if the hydraulical system fails, so too does he lose control. However, you can re-energize at least a blue system if you pop the ram air turbine with enough pressure in order to get at least home. So there's a little bit of, a, um, of an emergency. Do you want to pass? Just go ahead. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so there's a, so there's a little bit of, um, of an emergency system installed there. What is also interesting about these ailerons is that they act as elements for the uh, autopilot stabilization system. As well as that, they uh, can be trimmed by themselves. So you will notice there are no trim tabs on this elevator, uh, sorry, this aileron. What the pilot does, he has a switch on his control stick and by manner of deflecting the stick, trimming out the aircraft mid-flight via his control input, he flicks that switch and the aircraft now knows, ah, okay, this is the trim setting that the pilot wants me to fly up and it automatically adjusts the trim accordingly, which is rather neat. Moving then over to the flaps. Now we have the first flaps uh, on the outer section of the wing here, another flap that goes all around the boom, and then we have an inboard flap as well. Essentially three flap systems or three flaps installed in the aircraft. However, the central one around the boom as well as the outer one are combined, so it's more of a two-in-one system. These are Fowler flaps, which means that they extend on rails out of the wing and then pop down. You are familiar with these flaps because if you've ever sat on a commercial airliner and you sat behind the wing and you had a clear view of the wing as it is landing, you're seeing the exact same types of uh, flaps just popping out on rails and then lowering down. However, these are just one piece and they don't have a slot between the individual sections of the flap. So that's a little bit of a difference. Then talking about the boom here. The boom houses, um, next to the avionics systems that I already talked about, the fuel tank that I already talked about, also the inverters. What do the inverters do? There's two per each boom. The inverters change or translate direct current into alternating current. The batteries generally have DC, so direct current, whereas all the aircraft systems and the instruments need AC. Yeah. And the inverters just allow for that translation to happen. Moving then on to the rear section, we have a breaking point between the boom and the uh, vertical stabilizer. We have a uh, tail strike bumper, you might call it. And then we come over to the rudder. Once again, as you will see, there is no, uh, there is no yaw trim installed here, except this fixed trim tab right there. Again, trim is done by the pilot himself by flicking a switch while deflecting the rudders in a certain angle. Of course, this switch is not set on the control stick because he's controlling the rudders with the foot pedals, but an extra switch inside the cockpit. And at this point, I of course want to turn your attention to the massive elevator that we have 
on the CVIX. And it really extends from the uh, right hand vertical stabilizer over to the left hand and the whole piece that you see acts as the elevator. There is one exception and that is the trailing edge tab that you see on top on the rear end of the elevator. And this in usual use still acts as part of the elevator. However, as soon as the pilot pops his flaps, this counteracts the pitch change that you would naturally occur if you would be using your flaps, so, which is a ni nice little automated system. So the pilot actually doesn't have to worry about the pitch change in his aircraft as he's deploying the flaps, which is really rather nice. Of course, you might also wonder how to trim out the aircraft on the pitch axis. That again is done just like on the elevator. You just flick a switch on the control column based on the uh, deflection of the control stick. Then the uh, elevator is set at a trim angle and uh, yeah, Bob's your uncle. Let's move on towards the engines. The engines, the engines in the CVIX. Now, as you can see, work is being conducted right now, so you can get a clear view of how massive the housing actually is. Uh, this is a really unique opportunity to actually show you this, which is rather grand. But what we find in the CVIX are Avon Mark 208s. And these two engines combined produce a two, uh, 22,500 pounds of force, which is rather nice at static thrust. There is no afterburner or reheat, as it is also known in the aircraft. Beyond that, the engines are also connected to the hydraulic pumps, four of them set between the engines, as well as the two electrical generators. The faster spooling engine always powers three hydraulic pumps, as well as one generator, which means that if you have a failure in one of these engines, you're still always going to have three hydraulic pumps and one generator running, which is rather neat. We also, of course, have an arrestor hook that would be placed somewhere here. It is currently because they're working on the aircraft not shown. And then if we look on top, just between the engine exhaust, we also have this little flap uh, that opens up just like so, and that's where the ram air turbine sits in. As you might remember, one of the things that the ram air turbine does is re-energize the blue hydraulic system in case of failure. Right, now we're just going to move back towards the, uh, the boom sorry, the, the starboard side, uh, sorry, the port side of the aircraft. It's always strange explaining these things inverted as I'm walking towards you. And we, of course, have a, another look at the port wing. It's very much mirroring this, what you have seen already on the uh, starboard side, except the different light in the navigational lights. We have a pitot tube and so on. But now let's talk about the stores that could be carried on the Sea Vixen. On the outer stores, this is where the heavy stuff would go. So you'd have for example, a fuel tank, uh, 200 gallons that could be carried here, or you could have a thousand pound bombs or additional rocket packs and any sort of ordinance that you want to throw off the aircraft would generally go here. Beyond this air to ground equipment that the Sea Vixen could carry in the FAW variant that we have right here, which is of course the fighter all weather two, although it does have some air to ground capability, you have two inboard pylons as well. And this is where the air-to-air -air weaponry would go. What we would ha generally have in the Sea Vixen is initially a, uh, the, the fire streak missile. This is a very early air-to-air -air missile. It is IR homing uh, or rear aspect, which means that you can generally only achieve a lock if you're looking at the bomb of an enemy aircraft, because that's where the hot exhaust gases are, and the missile can then lock on. But it's got very limited range, effective range roughly two kilometers, and it's, it's a very sort of, um, yeah, old in first generation air-to-air -air missile that actually worked. Beyond that, you also had Fire Streak, which greatly improved the air to air capability of the Sea Vixen. Uh, Fire Streak had an effective range of up to seven kilometers. So it's not an MRAM or ARAM or a BVR missile by, by a long shot, but it's a lot better. And uh, it is also all aspect. So you could achieve a lock at uh, different angles as well, which is rather nice. We then also have this refueling probe that could be used for in-air refueling. And at this point, you might be wondering, as I'm going back towards the cockpit, uh, hang on, Chris, we talked about the rocket pods that are integral mounted inside the aircraft. We talked about the external stores, air to ground stores, right? Uh, we talked about the fire streak missile, the red top. What about guns? Well, the Sea Vixen doesn't have guns. It comes about in this time where there's a little bit of a honeymoon with technology. 
where nations are developing air-to-air -air missiles and they're so enamored by the idea of having a missile that can just follow an enemy aircraft and just shoot it down with 100% accuracy, spoiler alert, that was not the case, that the installation of fixed weaponry wasn't really a thing that they were considering. And the Sea Vixen was one of those aircraft, we see them across the globe really around this time, that just doesn't get fixed weaponry. Although the initial prototype, the DH-110, did have fixed weaponry planned into it. Before we now jump inside the cockpit, I just noticed that I forgot to talk to you about a very important aspect of the C-Wing. So we'll go back to the outer stores. And I'm going to talk to you about the Palust starter pod. Now the Palust starter pod, which is not shown here, uh, but it was roughly the same size. And this was a pod that the Sea Vixen could carry that acted as a ground-based starter unit. Now, we're just gonna have to wait for two helicopters to land over there. I'm not quite sure if you can hear me, but I'll try my best to speak up. It is a base, that's just how it is. But the Palus starter pod was really nice. A French invention, and it allowed the Sea Vixen, for example, if it takes off from a carrier, and wants to be landing at a ground base somewhere, and you weren't sure if you're gonna have ground starter units, the Palus starter pod fixed that because you would carry your ground starter unit with you, which is rather nice and off offers you a little bit of flexibility with the design. Right, with all of that said and done, I hope that you heard me in the last couple of minutes, but now we're gonna jump inside. See you there. Right, getting into the number two spot, uh, the coal pit, let's go. Just jumping up the ladders. And then, because there's no seat installed right now, this is going to look slightly awkward, but it works. Whoops! And we're inside, lowering ourselves, and yeah, this is very dark. I can see why they call this the coal pit over here. It's kind of comfortable though. But yeah, I am sitting in a place of the aircraft that does appear just to be a bit forlorn. You just feel a little bit yeah, left out of the action. But of course, this is an integral part of the crew station because the observer that would be sitting here would be operating the radar system of the aircraft in air-to-air -air mode, of course. When you're going air-to-ground, you can only really feed information towards the pilot. For example, you call out the altitude and the speed and so forth as you're doing your attack run. But beyond that, it's really up to the pilot to do everything. In air to air mode, this really would be the station um, that would uh, be crucial in trying to get the detection of the enemy aircraft right, trying to have everything locked on, then telling the pilot we're good to go and firing those missiles. Now, of course, with the seat, it does look a little bit different. We don't have the uh, radar scope installed right now. We have the Garmin navigational system in here of course, to keep the aircraft firing, but you still see parts of the blips and bobs that would make up this, uh, this uh, cruise station in we have. So I'm sitting in the observer seat, although the seat at the moment is, as you can tell, missing, since I'm sitting, literally sitting on the ground of the observer's position. Uh, you can also tell that by the fact that I have the seat raise and lower lever right here to my side, and I should be able, actually reaching down in order to get to it. Uh, rather than uh, sitting below it. But yeah, the observer position, what we have here usually uh, would be the radar scopes. That's what also this position appears so so dark in order to get that contrast on the, the radar scope and allow the observer to better track of what is going on. Of course, in an air-to-air -air role, the observer is quite crucial. In an air-to-ground role, less so. He's more of an auxiliary person in that role. As I said earlier, he's going to be calling out uh, information towards the pilot. Pilot sitting there and uh, we're not exactly in contact, but theoretically speaking, we could make hand signals if we wanted to, just like so. Uh, there is a window here to the uh, right-hand side of me that was an improvement in the CVIX and that came out with the uh, FAW2, as I understand it, improving the lighting conditions in this position just slightly. And beyond that, yeah, he's got all the important dials that you would expect this position to have as well. So let's go through those in detail right now. We will start with the observer seat, simply because it currently has only very few instruments as the original radar control set and scope are not installed. This would occupy the majority of the space in front of the observer, as you can see right here. And as you can also see, the injection seat is also currently not fitted. But this gives us a chance to look at the internals and the systems mounted behind the crew, which are usually out of view. So there you go. 
To the left of the observer, you will still find the oxygen regulator. Notice that rod sticking out to the right. If we follow this, we come to the in-flight refueling tank selector switches, which it passes until we hit the emergency oxygen control. Honestly, this is one of the most make-do British things I've ever seen in a plane. In front of the observer, you will find a G-meter, an altimeter, the fuel tank refueling indicators, and the accompanying light indicators, as well as the airspeed indicator in knots. And to the left of this, you will find your IFF aerial switch, and to its left, the IFF controls would you typically be found. Below this, where the radar scope would have been, the present-day Garmin GPS, not a sponsor, and your course deviation indicator. The CDI can be used for an instrument approach for landing. To the right then, the window lock lever, and below this, the horizontal stabilizer gear changer and the electrical generator indicators. And that is pretty much the observer position done as we see it right here. Let's switch over to the cockpit. Right, getting into the pilot seat then, we're just gonna use the ladder that was so kindly provided by the manufacturer, by the Havilland. And we're just gonna step up gracefully, cheerfully, as we always do, stepping into the cockpit. It's gonna be a little bit tricky. The pilot seat is missing as they're currently working on the aircraft, but let's lower ourselves into the position. And here we go. You can definitely immediately tell that this is sort of a 1960s, sort of actually late 1950s, early 1960s cockpit design because there's a lot of bips and bobs everywhere, lots of switches. It really is a carnival in here. But uh, let's take that and just go through it in detail. Come on board. Looking at the cockpit, we are greeted by a confusing number of buttons and switches, often arranged somewhat haphazardly. So a very typical cockpit for the early Cold War jet aviation age. I will be summarizing some of this stuff because quite frankly, if I go through every little switch, we will still be here tomorrow and won't remember half of it. But if you are a Patreon or channel member, I have uploaded some pictures of the manual that you can use to get all the details if you are so inclined. Of course, also a big thank you to my Patreons and channel members, since it is you who fund these Inside the Cockpit filming trips and they would not exist otherwise. Starting as always then on the far left, working our way forward and then hooking over to the right. To the far left, we will see a few levers. We start with the cabin air supply, the air brake emergency switch, as well as the air rest hook lever with an integrated emergency setting. We have dimmer switches for external and internal lighting and the ventilation temperature control. Moving forward, a flap and fuel crossfeed levers, the low pressure fuel cocks, as well as the pitch trim setting speed. This is currently set to a slow trim, as well as the rudder trim switch. Remember what I told you on the outside of the plane about the rudder trim? This is that switch. To the left of this, the dual aileron and rudder trim indicator. Above this, the hydraulic pressure gauges for the red system, together with the brake supply. The red system is the backup hydraulic system. Then we have the awesomely named high intensity light switch. To the right of this, the parking brake with an emergency setting. Moving forward and upward, jet pipe temperature control switches and your individual engine relight buttons. On the throttle control, you'll find the individual throttle controls with an integrated high pressure fuel cock. If you want to shut off the fuel cocks, you depress the stops in the middle and pull the throttle controls fully aft. On the right throttle lever, you have an integrated air brake switch and radio transmit button. Between the levers, the UHF mute button, as well as a hot air blast switch acting as a windscreen wiper. You also have color-coded pressure gauges. The triple hydraulic pressure gauge of the main green system here is for the brakes, and then we have the pressure indicators for the blue and the yellow system. Moving forward to the front left, the undercarriage release lever with an emergency setter, as well as the indicator lights, one for the arrestor hook and the other pair for the horizontal stabilizer gear. Then the central instrument board. Top left, the MAC counter next to the speedometer in knots, set above the undercarriage position indicator and the altimeter. We then have the artificial horizon and HSI, above a slip as well as the angle of attack indicator. 
We also have our vertical speed and a standby artificial horizon. To the right, the engine jet pipe temperature, the engine RPMs, as well as the fuel gauges. And finally, the fuel flow rate and consumed fuel indicator. And that is set next to the drop tank fuel transfer indicators. Below this instrument, starting on the left, the air brake position indicator, the hydraulic temperature gauges for the red system, followed by the horizontal stabilizer and the flap position indicator. Further right, at an angle, the oxygen content gauge, as well as the PAS setting switches and the cabin altimeter. Moving further to the right then, and oh boy, here we go. Much of what you're seeing right here has to do with the fuel system. So we have the fuel pump circuit breakers as well as the auxiliary pump controls. Below this, the uh, fuel pump switches as well as the pitot tube heaters, the inverter switches, and then we have loads of switches for the trim, the lighting and the radios, as well as some other systems. And below all of this, the UHF system is missing. We have the oxygen regulator next to the engine master ignition and accumulator switches. You'll also find your generator isolators and engine start push buttons. A warning light panel is set above the fire extinguisher control. To the right then we have the wing fold locking lever as well as the wing fold selector. The emergency release for the ram air turbine would also be found here as well. Mind you it is installed in such a way that the observer also has easy access to it. Although I don't know if this is by design or out of consequence. The nose wheel steering wheels, the inner one is for fine, the outer one for course control. Right, if you think we are done, think again. Back to the central instruments, but this time we look up above your basic instrument gauges and we will find even more stuff. Top left, the emergency canopy release next to the CDI. In the middle, the fuel flow indicators, and to the right, the auto stabilizer control for rubber and ailerons. Remember what I said about that when we were on the outside, as well as the accelerometer. There is also a pitch trim indicator and the modern radio and GPS system that sits where the original gun sight would have been. And if we look up, we find a whiskey compass and a mirror. So say cheese. We ain't done just yet. The final piece in the puzzle is of course the control stick, situated between your legs. The large twin button is for the pitch and roll trim, that's the button I mentioned on the outside. And the small button is for the camera and auto throttle, depends on what you have selected. The yellow switch is the safety catch, covering the trigger. Below this, the autopilot quick cutoff. And further down the stick, the aileron gear change wheel. You turn this clockwise to reduce the hand movement required for aileron deflection, usually used during approach and landing. So if you are still with me, give yourself a round of applause. These early jets tend to have cockpits that can be a little bit overwhelming, but we got here in the end. So now, as a bit of a reward, let me take you through the startup and flying sequences. Okay, so having gone through the cockpit in detail, let's talk a little bit about how we could actually get one of these aircraft into the sky. Obviously, at this point, I'm in the pilot seat, as you can see. There's an observer somewhere over there. Don't be shy, say hello. Hello. There we go. He's going to fly with me. He's going to operate the radar system for air to air. And of course, going to scream at me for altitude readings and the speed readings. If we're going into air to ground and if I don't pull up, he's going to hit me very, very hard. Now. Before we can get to do that, however, we're going to go through the takeoff sequence. Uh, first things first, we'll have to start the engine, right? And what I'm, I'm going to do now is relay to you how you would start these engines with the Palus starter port, simply because that's a little bit of a special thing that comes with the Sea Vixen, right? Uh, first things first, we of course assume that all the pre-start checks have been done, right? The external power has been collected, connected, and then we start putting the uh, low pressure fuel cock on, on and make sure that the high pressure fuel cock is off. The number one booster pumps should be on, the uh, standby inverter should be on, the starter master switch should be on, and the ignition switches as well as the generator switches and the battery switches should also all be on. At this point, you signal the Polus crew that you're ready and you press the starter button for two seconds. You're now going to wait for your RPM reading on the first engine to reach about 10%, at which point you're going to push the uh, high pressure fuel cock into on. 
At that point, you're going to uh, wait for the engines to, uh, to spool up. You're going to have them uh, roughly sitting roughly between 31 to 34% idling. Uh, the jet uh, pipe temperature should be no more than 625 degrees Celsius. And there, are, of course, should be no warning lights uh, to your bottom right here for the oil, the generator, the hydraulic systems, and so on and so forth. If everything uh, goes well, then you can repeat the whole procedure with engine number two. And once that one is, uh, is all uh, set up and uh, running idly, nice and easy, you're of course going to go into your pre-flight checks. And uh, then as you're ready to take off, if you're on a carrier, you're putting your flaps down. If you're on an airfield, you put your flaps up. Of course, you can also take off uh, from an airfield with the uh, flaps down, but the manual does say the flaps should be up. Um, you increase the RPMs to 80%, uh, you check your brakes, that is if you're on an airfield, and then you go to 100% full power straight down the carrier deck or straight down the airfield, and you lift off. Now the performance of this aircraft is relatively simple. It does not reach uh, supersonic speeds in level flight. It just sits just below that, 1,100 kilometers per hour, which is like, what, Mach 0.96 or something like that. Um, so very close to supersonic, but not quite there yet. In a dive, however, the C Vixen will go supersonic, which is quite neat. Once you've done everything you want to do during your flight and your observer is asking you, are we there yet? Hello, we there yet? I can't see. <laughs> there we go. If once he uh, gets annoys you with those sort of questions and you want to head home, you can do so landing. Uh, let's go through the normal sort of uh, descent procedure and landing procedure. Like normal descent, initially, if you are above 350 uh, knots, that's 600 kilometers per hour, uh, you extend your air brakes to out and you lower your RPMs to about 70%. You then deaccelerate to below 600 kilometers per hour. And on your descent, uh, your final descent, you uh, pop the air brakes in. Uh, you have the gear down, the flaps to 20 degrees, and you're going to go down to uh, 370 kilometers an hour. As you're downwind, 300 kilometers an hour, and then you go on final, you turn on final, you put the flaps to fully down, and you touch down at roughly uh, 230, uh, 250 kilometers per hour. Of course, if you're landing on a carrier, you've got your arrestor hook to bring you to a sudden stop as well. You want to hit that wire, and if you're on an airfield, you just use the full runway. And yeah, that's pretty much how you would operate the Seavixen in a nutshell. And uh, I hope that you all enjoyed this episode. And if you did, do uh, tell us down below uh, in the comments. Feedback is always appreciated. I of course want to thank uh, Navy Wings for this fantastic access to their aircraft. All information about Navy Wings also in the description. Give their website a look. And of course, they're also a charity. So if you want to get involved, check uh, that out there. I also want to thank Josh and uh, Drac for helping and filming and setting everything up today. Uh, links in the description to Drac's channel as well. If you're into in, uh, naval ships and carriers, you should definitely check him out as well. And uh, if you want to support the channel and make more Inside the Cockpit possible, please also check out Patreon and channel memberships for a way for you to get involved in the making of these episodes. And as always, at this point, I just wish you a great day and have some fantastic people around you. Enjoy your, uh, your day and as always, see you in the sky.